Mark chapter 2, if you have a Bible, swipe to a Bible. Uh, we're going to look at 13 through 17. We'll, we'll try to put that on the screen as well. Mark chapter 2, this is the word of God. It is appropriate to stand up, to honor that this is no ordinary book. Mark chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. This is what it says. Y'all ready? All right, verse 13. It says, he, this is Jesus, Jesus went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Look at verse 15. And as he, Jesus, reclined at table in his house, he was in Levi's crib in his house, in his house, he says, he reclined at the table in his house. Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, they showed up, y'all, look at them. When they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, I think they said it with a little, you know, a little, a little hate, a little, a little pride, a little religious. Uh, uh, it said, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And verse 17, Jesus stepped in. He didn't let his disciples answer. Jesus said, Jesus heard it and he said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. <laughs> Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. You may be seated. You may be seated. Y'all, I, I, um, I believe the Holy Spirit's main message, I want the young and the old to hear it today, the left side and the right side. Y'all listen up. I believe the Holy Spirit's message comes right from the end of verse 17. Look, look at the end of verse 17. Jesus is giving the goal of, of this whole story. He's giving the purpose. And he says this in verse 17. Look at the last sentence. He says, I, y'all say that with me. That last sentence. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Say that again. I came, he's telling you, not to call the righteous, the, the people that think they're righteous. That's what he's saying. But sinners. Sinners. Somebody say sinners. 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 That's actually, uh, uh, we were talking about, uh, me and Zay were talking about teaching, teaching. That's actually uh, a Greek word for, uh, that, that's translated sinners. It's the word harmatia. Harmatia. Uh, theologically, is homartiology. Homartiology, harmatia, is the study of sin. Homartia, uh, uh, homartia means sin. It literally means, listen, it means to miss the mark. It is a shooting term, it's a gaming term, it's a targeting term. It made me think about when me and, and, and my brother uh, John Tamlin and, and James Robinson were in a, in a cold garage, in, in John Tamlin's cold garage last year, and, and he said, let's go out here so we can shoot some darts. So we was throwing darts. And, and some hamartia happened to me. I, I remember one time I missed the whole board. Now, they were some pros, but I missed the whole Paris. I was trying to aim at, and I remember one time just missing the whole board. That's what this word means. When you say sinners, it means you missed the whole board. You didn't miss the whole purpose that you're here. Uh, Romans 3, 23 says, all have sinned, hamartia. All of us have missed the mark. All of us uh, have fallen short. None of us glorify God like we should. None of us praise God like we should. None of us read the Bible like we should. None of us, none of us tell people about Jesus like we should. None of us love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and strength. None of us eat and drink, and everything that we do, we give, give it glory to God. That's what he said. Jesus said, if that's you and that's all of us, he says, I came. <laughs> I came to call sinners. That's the word. Those who have failed to love God in our feelings. Those who have failed to love God in our thought life. Those who have failed to love God in our relationships and give him the glory he deserves. Hamatia. Jesus says, that's why I came. I came 
for you. Hear Paul, hear the Apostle Paul, an ex-terrorist. He one of them real bad sinners. Somebody say real bad. Yeah, real bad. In 1 Timothy 1.15, look, look at what Paul said. He said, he said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? Sinners. And then he says, and I am the worst of them all. That man was humble. He was real about it. I, I, one of my mentors used to say, I'm the worst sinner I know. Is that true of you? He said, I said, how, how you say that? I'm the worst sinner I know because I'm, I'm the only one that knows all these nasty thoughts that go through my head all day. I'm the only one that knows all these nasty attitudes in my heart. I know when I'm jealous when I look at Zach. He don't know. I know when I'm lustful when I'm looking at her. She don't know. He says, I'm the worst sinner I know because I have all these sins on the inside of me that, that you may never see. And if you're honest, you are the worst sinner that you know because we don't know all the mess going on in your mind and in your brain. If we could put it up on the screen, you would have been tipped up out of here like, oh, Lord, have mercy. You better be glad we ain't put your mess on the screen. Paul said, I'm the worst sinner. And I'm so glad because that's why Jesus came. Praise God. Ah, uh, I came for sinners. So with the Spirit's help, just three points today. Three points today. And I want y'all to, to lean in and listen. Number one, number one. Uh, Jesus came to call sinners personally. Can we say that together? Jesus came to call sinners personally. This is good news. Look at verse 13 and 14. It says that, here it is, here it is. It says that he, Jesus, went out again. So Zach preached the message. He was in that house. Uh, theologians say that's probably Peter's house. And, and uh, everybody was packed up in there. The man, the roof, tore the roof off and all that. He came up out of that house into another house. He went out again beside the sea. He was walking by the sea, like me and my wife was last week. We was, we, we, we was out on the, on, on the west coast by the ocean. That's what Jesus was walking by the ocean. And all the crowd was coming to him. Can y'all see it? All these people flocking to Jesus. And he was teaching them because he wants your mind transformed, right? Jesus is the greatest teacher. He wants your mind transformed about who he is and, and what he's about. And he was teaching them. And verse 14 says, and as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Jesus looked past the crowd and saw one person. I believe in this little crowd today. He's not looking at the crowd. He's looking at you personally. He's talking to you personally. Jesus was not impressed with the crowd. He had one person in mind. It was Levi. He pressed past the crowd, and he looked at Levi because Jesus desires a personal relationship with sinners, especially the worst, like Paul said, the worst. Jesus wants a personal relationship with you. Can you look at the person next to him? They may not listen right now, but tell them Jesus wants a personal relationship with you. Just minister to him. He wants a personal relationship with you. Verse 13 says he, talking about Jesus. Verse 13 says him, talking about Jesus. Verse 13 says he, talking about Jesus. What does that let, you, let us know? This story in verse 13 through 17 is about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. This chapter, chapter 2, is all about Jesus. Yeah, we got this thing on replay, y'all. It's on repeat. Uh, this book, the Gospel of Mark, is all about Jesus. Uh, this book, all 66 books, from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus. This world, all seven continents, 195 countries, and four million plus cities, is all about Jesus. This life, this broken, brief, yet beautiful life of 7.8 billion people is all about Jesus. This is what life is all about. Let me pause. What is your life about? If these verses and this chapter and this book and the Bible and the world and the 7.8 billion people, Colossians 1.16 says, were made by him and for him. If your life is not about Jesus, it's a tragic, meaningless life. So the Lord got you here this morning just to let you know your life is about 
him. It says he, him, he. Now watch verse 13. It says he went out. Somebody say he went out. 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 Jesus, the name of this series is Jesus on the move. Jesus is on the move, and we see him again. He's already healed this paralyzed man. He's already forgiven his sins, and there he is again. He won't stop. He won't stop. It says he went out again. Jesus is on the move again. Watch this. As the flesh and blood expression of God's missionary heart to lovingly pursue broken people. Why in the Gospel of John do we always see Jesus moving? Why in the Gospel of Matthew do we always see Jesus moving towards broken people? Why in the Gospel of Luke do we always see Jesus moving towards broken people? Whenever you see Jesus, he's on the move because he's a flesh and blood expression of God's missionary heart. God is a missionary at heart. Jesus is an expression of the heart of God. Jesus is on the move again because God is always on the move because he always pursues broken people. Somebody say he went out. He went out. He went out. He went out to them. And ultimately, he went out from heaven to earth. He went out of heaven onto earth to pursue selfish, straying people like you and me to bring us back into the embrace of God again. But look at verse 14. It says, and as he passed by, he, he passed by the sea. By, by the way, he passed by the sea that he made. <laughs> He's like, I made that. Look at that. That's looking nice. Uh, he passed by the sea that he made, teaching the people that he made, and he saw a dude named Levi in verse 14. And watch this, watch this. Keanu Levi, he was, he was doing something that I don't know if any of us have seen. He was sitting at the tax booth. Like, what in the world is a tax booth? The man was out there in the public, just out there. By the sea, everybody else passed. And it, one dude, just, he was just like this. He was just, he was just sitting now, like this, sitting. And the sign above where he was sitting said, tax booth. Sitting in the tax booth. You see him by the sea, looking at the ocean, all the people around. He's sitting at the tax booth. All of a sudden, this man roll up to him and say, follow me. And my man's like, I'm out of here. And he start walking and following Jesus. When Jesus said, follow me, those two words capture his heart for Levi. When you hear Jesus say, follow me, he's saying, I want you, Levi. When he says, follow me, he said, I desire you, Levi. When he says, follow me, those are not just two words. He's saying, I love you, Levi. I choose you to be on my team. Follow me. Now, this is crazy because you've got to understand something about tax collectors. I don't know if Jesus know what he, does Jesus really know what he's doing? Do we really know who he, I mean, do we really know who he's messing with? Do we really know who he's talking to? Jesus, are you sure you want Levi to follow you? Oh, no, Levi in that tax booth, Jesus. Uh, 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 do, uh, uh, that means, y'all, he was, he, was, he was IRS back then. That, no, no, no. That means he was tax collector. Now, 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 now you got to do a little history, a little study to understand how crazy it is that Jesus would want this man, Levi, on his team. Look, 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 y'all. I, I, I did a little study. I did a little study for you. Look, tax collectors were the most hated in the Jewish community. Tax collectors were greedy, political pimps. Listen, young brothers and sisters, greedy, political pimps. Watch this. Tax collectors were Jewish people, but they were hired by the oppressive Roman government to stab their own Jewish people in the back and steal their money. They were sellouts. They got hired to pimp their own people. The oppressive Roman government were enemies of the Jewish people, especially the poor Jewish people. 
And these political pimps would take advantage of the poor Jewish people, so they were hated. And let me tell you, they were filthy rich. Because later on, don't do it now, later on, look back at Luke 19 again, and it was this short dude named Zacchaeus. He was a short old little pimp. That's what he was. A little four foot six pimp. That's what he was. He pimped the people, and it says he was filthy rich. Now, how did he get rich? It says he was a chief tax collector. Now, when Jesus saved Zacchaeus, you remember what Zacchaeus said. He said, all the people that I cheated, somebody say cheated. He said, all the people I cheated, I'm going to pay back what I stole from my own people four times as much. These people were political pimps. Levi was straight thug crook. He was the worst of the worst. His gang, tax collector mafia, like they were storing it up. Tax collector mafia, baby. I mean, like literally, they were the most hated sinners in society. So much so that in verse 16, even the Pharisees came to the disciples was like, psst, 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 hey, why is Jesus hanging with tax collectors and sinners? They're like, why do this? Does he even know? These people are the worst of the worst. Why? And what's interesting, Amy, is that when you see tax collectors in the New Testament, it's always and sinners. It's never just tax collectors. It's tax collectors and sinners because a tax collector and a sinner was synonymous. Today it will be a crooked politician who steals from poor grandmamas. It will be a crooked politician that steals from struggling single moms. Even worse than that. Even worse than that. When you think and you look at these tax collectors, it's literally like serial murderers. It's like people who do mass school shooters. These were the worst. Can somebody say the worst? The worst of sinners in society. And watch this. This is exactly who Jesus came for. It is to this kind of nasty, evil, thieving person that Jesus says, follow me. I want you. I love you. I choose you. You're rolling with my squad now. Wow. Wow. But don't get it twisted, y'all. Jesus' love for sinners like me moves him not to just choose us, but to change us. He didn't connect with, Matt, uh, with Levi just to say, you know what, I just love people. I love dirty people. I love sick people. I love no, no, no. He, he will find you as you are, but he won't leave you as you are. He chose him to change him. He calls us out of sin into a new relationship with him. Do y'all get that? He's calling him out. Now, the reason why we need to study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we need to understand the full picture, is because, watch this, Paris, in Luke 5.32, Luke adds two words to what Jesus said to Levi. I'll read it, Luke 5.32. He says, Jesus says, I came to call sinners to repentance. Mark left that out. Luke added that. He says, I came to call sinners to turn. I came to call them to be sad about stealing from people. I came to call them out of stealing and out of lying and, and out of the tax collecting mafia. I called them out to turn to me. Jesus Christ did not just come to choose sinful people. He came to change sinful people. Jesus came to call sinners, somebody say personally. personally, especially sinful people who feel like they didn't wild out too much, they didn't smoke too much, too much sex, too much pornography, too much hating, too much shooting, too much killing. Jesus especially, he picks the worst in society. Remember what Paul said, an ex-terrorist? He says, I'm the worst. Jesus picks the worst, <laughs> and he puts them on his squad. 
Jesus is calling you this morning. I don't know who you are, but he's calling you. Are you listening? Are you listening? So Jesus came to call sinners personally. But number two, watch this, watch this. This is amazing right here. This blew me away. Uh, number two, put that up there for me. Uh, Jesus came to call sinners collectively. Can y'all say that with me? Jesus came to call sinners collectively. Y'all watch this, watch this. Look at verse 15. This is what, this is what was amazing to me, Janae. L look at verse 15. It says, and as he, Jesus, this is Jesus, reclined at table in his house, this is Levi's house. Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, but there were many who followed him. So it's not just one-on-one, -on -one, but it's personally, which tells us something. This ought to shock you. This ought to shock you. It tells us something, that Jesus loves to hang out with a community of sinners. So not only was it the tax collector, Matthew, but he brought his people. He brought the whole tax collector mafia with him. That was all up in there. And then, you know, a, a grandma used to say, birds of a feather flock together. Yeah, they was all rolling. All of them. It says that he was with them. Jesus loves not just one, but a community of sinners. It's comfortable for him to be around outwardly notorious, sinful people. Did you hear what I said? I said it's comfortable for Jesus to be around outwardly categorized, stigmatized, notorious, evil, wicked, sinful people. He loves to be around non-religious people. He loves to hang out with non-churchy people. He loves to hang out with cussing, smoking, banging, drinking sinners. Man, man, Jesus was in the club. Okay, I'm going to just say it that way. He was in the club. Jesus, like, now don't get it twisted. Now, tell me I was in the church. And the Lord said, he said, the pastor, so I was up. And, and you know, I ain't say all that. Discernment. She prayed for discernment. I ain't say all that. I'm just saying, Jesus, well, he, was, he, was, he was attracted to that group, and that group was attracted to him. You know how I know that? Verse 15 says he was reclining. Here's another cultural situation. He was reclining. Somebody say reclining. reclining. At the table. See, they were straight. They was, hey, they was straight player with it back then, man. They, they, the way they used to eat, the way they used to eat. And just, so what's going on? And, and me and Karen, we saw this in... Um, we saw this, some people on the beach doing, eating like this. They had a little table in the Jewish culture, and they would eat and put all the food around it. They were like Italian meal, just like, like, a, like sharing all the food. And they would prop up and lay down, real chill mode, like uh, lay down like this, and they would use their left elbow to hold themselves up and like this, and then grab a little bread and be like, all right. And, and Jesus was reclining with them. And he was just chilling right there. And, and later on, I think around verse 16, it says, that, remember, remember the Pharisee says, why does he eat with sinners and tax collectors? You got to realize, eating is powerful, y'all. That's why that's one of our M's in our joy communities. When you eat with somebody, especially in a Jewish culture, you, you are warm to them. Uh, uh, not only the, it, 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 it communicates that you accept them. Somebody say accept. It communicates that you welcome them. So if you're willing to eat, because in 1 Corinthians uh, 5, I think it is, uh, Paul tells the church not to even eat with believers who say they're believers, but they're living in sin. That's how powerful it is to eat with somebody because you're really saying, I love you just the way you are. You're welcome just like you are. So Jesus, do you have that vision of Jesus? Is that the Jesus you serve in the club, chilling out, uh, 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 got some bread, dipping it, talking? Yeah, what's up, bro? You, you all right? Yeah, Jesus like, yeah, I healed this person over there. Yeah, oh, you doing that? You doing, are you taking their money? Oh, man, come on, man. They just chilling and talking. You know what it communicates more than acceptance and welcome? When you recline and eat with somebody, 
It communicates, y'all ready? Friendship. Friendship. Jesus is at the club with all the worst people in the community, hanging out with them, eating with them, communicating to them that I want you to be my friend. I want you to be my friend. Yes, I'm going to talk about changing you, but, but first, I just want you to be my friend. Yeah, I'm going to talk about what you're doing and all of that, but first, I want you to know that I love you just the way you are, but too much to leave you like you are, but I'm going to be your friend. That's why Matthew eleven nineteen, when they, they tried to put a bad name on Jesus, you know, they almost basically cussed him out. And you know how they cussed Jesus out? You know how they put a bad reputation on his name to try to cancel his ministry? Guess what they did? In Matthew eleven nineteen, they said, he is a friend of sinners. No, they, they were just basically because they was basically trying to take him out. He, 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 y'all don't want to follow him. We're going to pull out the big car right now. We're going to pull out the ace of spades. He's a friend of sinners. He takes sinners into his own heart. He talks with sinners just the way they are. He welcomes and accepts and builds a loving relationship with sinners. Like the old, the old hymn, Jesus, what a friend to sinners. Jesus, what a friend of sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Oh, Lord, I thank you. Jesus, what a friend to sinners. He's a friend. So let me pause right here. I believe the Holy Spirit wanted me to pause and look at your eyes. Jesus is not here no more, physically. He died, he rose, he's at the right hand of the Father, he sent his Holy Spirit, and that, there's these people that he gave his name to. They're called Christians. It means little Christs. And so the question is, are you a friend of sinners? If you claim to follow Jesus, is that your reputation? Is, is, is that our reputation as a church here in my hometown? Is City of Joy Fellowship have a reputation of being friends of sinners? Now let me stop. Let me tell you, let me make it, can I make it personal? I'm going to make it personal. Um, Zay, I was, you know, I'm trying to build friendships. I got friends that I didn't even go to school with. Most of them left. Uh, but it's just new friends that I meet on the block. I meet over here. I meet at the store. I meet in the city. I meet in the city. And sometimes I just hang out with them. And so I was with one of my, one of my friends the other day. We was rolling down State Street. We was rolling down State Street. And, uh, you know, one of my friends, he smoked a little smoky. You know, he drink a little drinky, but he my friend. I tell my wife, when I come home smelling like stuff, I ain't tipped back by God's grace. I ain't tipped back. I just been with some of my people, you know what I'm saying? And so we were rolling, rolling, this true story, rolling down State Street with my friend. And uh, he looked at me and said, you ever heard of bougie people? You ever heard of bougie people? I said, yeah, what was you talking about? He said, you see that church right there? It's a true story. He said, you see that church right there? I said, yeah. He said, they bougie right there. He said, that church right there, they think they better than everybody. He said, if you don't wear the right suits up in there, they're going to look at you like you crazy. He said, if, you don't have, he said if, the, if the ladies don't have the right dresses on, they're going to look at you like you crazy. He said, that church right there, if, 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 if you don't look the right way and say the right thing and live the right way, you feel judged. I don't know if that's true or not, but that was his perspective. Kind of like in verse 16, when the Pharisees said to the disciples, why your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? 
They thought you had to, uh, 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 who you hung around made you better. They, they, the Pharisees thought what you did made you better. What you didn't do made you better. Who you didn't roll with made you better. They didn't understand that Jesus is a friend of sinners. And my prayer when my homie was telling me that is, oh God, I pray that that would never be me, that that would never be City of Joy Fellowship, that that would never be any of your people. That those who are unbelievers, drinking Hennessy at the club, smoking weed, would look at me and say, oh, he too good. I don't meet his standard. Jesus is a friend of sinners. And Jesus said in John 20, 21, he says, as the Father sent me, so I send you into the world. The same way I represented love like the Good Samaritan is the same way that you should represent love. I believe the Lord is speaking to us today. Family, we are called as forgiven sinners to be friends of unforgiven sinners. The only difference between them and me is that I've been forgiven by God's grace and they have not been yet. Amen. Come on, we can clap for that. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. He's called us as forgiven sinners to invest our lives in unforgiven sinners. Look at verse 15 again. Look at verse 15 again. It says... And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. So, 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 watch this. There's three words left off the page. We got to move. We got to move. Um, it says that he, he was in his house. Can you say in his house? That was Levi's house. He was in his house. That just kept ringing in my head. It was in his house. Like the Holy Spirit said, did you see that? I said, see that? See that? See that? See that? See that? I see that? See that? In his house. It was in his house. It was in his house. When all this happened, he was in a house. He was in Levi's house. So this is what I want to say to you. This is what I want to say. I want you to hear from the Lord. Brothers and sisters, including myself, like Levi, get a vision to help sinners meet Jesus in your house. Okay, I got half of an amen. Let me say that again. I know it's a Okay, brothers and sisters, like Levi, get a vision for sinners to meet Jesus in your house. In your house. That's what, that's what Levi did. Can you, I mean, he was with his boys. He was like, hey, hey, look, look, y'all, I met this, I, hey, hey, y'all heard of Jesus? Jesus from Nazareth doing all that healing and stuff. They say he's the Messiah. Look, look, I met him. And he was the first religious person that didn't condemn me. Come on over to the crib. He's going to be over there. Hey, bro. Hey, bro. He's the, he, he, didn't, he didn't point out the fact that I smelled like weed. Come over here. He didn't judge me because my skirt was all tight and my stuff was all hanging out. My, all that was hanging out and all that. He didn't judge me. He just said, I'm sick. you got to come meet him. He didn't tell me to drop my stuff and drop me, you know, I came to Jesus with a blunt. Y'all know my story. I came to Jesus with a blunt in my hand. Now, did he keep it in there? He didn't keep it in there. He took a Bible, put the blunt out, put a Bible in it. All right, but that's good. But, but right when he came to me, he didn't say, get out of my face. I came with a blunt. Look, 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 look. Levi said, come over to my house. Come to my crib, man. Y'all got to meet this man. He does not judge. Just like the woman in John chapter 4. Y'all got to meet this man. All he did was ask me if I had husbands. He didn't call me a hoe. He said, do you have a husband? He's so gracious with our sin, but he changes us. He said, come and pack out my crib. They packed out Levi's house. Get a vision, Kempton, for how God wants sinners to meet him in your crib because of how you treat them. Because you're ordering some Popeyes and they smell like weed and hence and all of that and she ain't dressed right, but they're coming over to your house and they're hearing and they're seeing the love of God. And this is what I wrote down. I want y'all to get this. Family, look, Jesus loves to reveal himself to sinful people who don't yet know him in the comfortable relational setting of a home. A lot of people come to East St. Louis and do a little work and get on out of here. No, do a little work and bring them to your home. 
like some of us are doing in our own church. Praise God if you have a house. Hallelujah. I've been homeless before. Yeah, hey, hey, hallelujah. Yeah, some of us won't clap because we we never known not having a house. And, and that's God's grace too. But I'm going to clap because I've been homeless without a house. <laughs> Praise God I got a house. Praise God if you have a house, if you have an appointment, have, have an apartment, have a place to lay your head, have a place to rest, have the place to, you know, to be you. Everybody need a place where they can just run around and stuff boogers in your eyes, snot in your nose, teeth, breath stank, and just happy. Ain't got to do nothing for nobody. Just out there, just eating, doing your little family traditions, all of that. That's good. That's your house. God and bless you with it. On Friday nights, we got Turner movie night, and we get excited, and all that is good. Traditions for your family and you. But watch this. Your house is not just for you. Your house is for what? the body of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 4 says, be hospitable with one another. Invite people into your house. Praise God for our joy communities. Praise God for the chikes, inviting people into their house. Praise God for the magrams, inviting people into their house. Praise God for the Robinsons, inviting people into their house. Praise God for many of you who invite people into your house. Your house is for your family and for you. Your house is for the body of Christ. But this is where I think the challenge is. Here's the challenge, and we're, we're, we're almost done. God has given you your house, your apartment, your space to help sinners meet the Savior, like Levi. The question is, are you building relationships? If you know Christ, some of you do not, and we welcome you to know Christ today. But if you know Christ, are you building relationships with people who don't know him yet? And inviting them into your life, inviting them into your circle. I don't claim to be a hero at this. I'm still learning. We've tried some things, and some have worked, some have not. We've had Super Bowl parties in homes. Somebody shared their testimony. We've invited people over, and we just prayed the gospel over them. We've made new friends and just invited them over. Now, sometimes it'll cost us. You've got to have discernment. One of the cats we invited over, he stole some stuff. He stole some stuff. That's okay. Jesus says, store up your treasures in heaven anyway. He already prepared you for the dude that's going to steal from you, the woman that's going to steal from you. Love him anyway. I remember when Zach shared this verse with me. Matt shared the same verse with me. Isaiah 58, verse 7. Watch this. This is probably not going to be your favorite memory verse, but receive it. Isaiah 58, 7, talking about true worship. Everybody was fasting. Oh, we're seeking you, Lord. We're seeking you. We're seeking you. We're so spiritual. This is what the Lord said. One of the things he said was, share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor. Where? Hold up. Hold up, did he say, that ain't in my, what, what, into my, you mean take some bread to the shelter? Don't you mean take some bread to the shelter, take the bread to the corner, take the bread to the dude that's hot? No, he said bring them in your crib. Let me just share this real quick. Last night, this is a true story, you can ask my wife, last night. Last night, I was studying my sermon, preparing for my sermon on how Jesus wants you to use your house to introduce himself to sinners. And I, and I got a phone call. It was my wife, Mark. It was my wife. True story. She said, babe. I, I, I knew. I knew. I knew. She said that. She, babe. Because she know the sermon prep is like sacred. Like if you ain't like this is like I'm on the mountain like Moses up in here like do not call me like this is about she's like babe somebody's at our door now it's after nine o'clock it's pitch black outside somebody over here knocking on the door they in an ATV 
It's pitch black in the front yard, got mud everywhere, knocking on the door, talking about, I'm looking for the pastor. Talking about he met you at a party. <laughs> True story. I'm like, hold up now. Now, woman, don't you know that I'm studying? Don't you know that I'm preparing a sermon to tell our church that they ought to use their house so that people that don't know Jesus can meet them? Do you think I really have time to come and do what I'm preaching? I'll be right there. Long story short, true story. They're out there, homie from the hood, out there. I know him. We talk. I get to tell him about Jesus again. I get to put a little something in his hand. Bless you, bless you, my brother. But you better know that Jesus is Lord and prayed for him and laid my hands on him. And I'm like, okay, Lord, you really calling us to live this stuff. Yeah. Let's pause just for a second. Ain't but two more minutes. We got to go. But I just want to pause and allow you to open your heart to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Father, forgive me, forgive us for times we've been like Pharisees, for times we've been like that Levite, for times we've been like that priest. We passed by, we thought that our house was just for our TV and our kids and our little traditions. Lord, show us, show me how you want to use our houses like Levi as a space to invite more hurting, lost, precious souls to Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. This last point, we don't even have time to go there. I'll just give it to you. Jesus came to call sinners who respond to him with humility. Who respond to him with humility. That's what we want to ask you to do. The Pharisees responded with pride. Why does he hang out? Levi responded with humility. He left everything and he, found, he left his sin and found the Savior. He left corruption and found Christ. He left his life of wickedness and followed the Savior and the Lord. He left everything, and guess what? He ended up changing his name. Anybody know who he changed his name to? Who said it? Matthew. You know what Matthew means? Gift of God. Levi knew that in his crookedness, he could never change himself. It had to be a gift of God's grace. And he went on and wrote a book about Jesus called the Gospel of Matthew. Don't tell me what the Lord won't do. He'll take the worst and turn you into a gospel writer. Whew, when you humble yourself before him, and then he says, I want more people to, like me to know you, and I want you to use my living room for revival. I want you to use my living room for revival.